This video is just a quick introduction to the nervous system. So the nervous system is basically made out of two parts, the central nervous system or the CNS, which basically is made of the brain and the spinal cord. There's also the peripheral nervous system or the PNS that contains muscles and glands. In general, the nervous system functions in receiving stimuli, integrating that information, and then sending messages. Now there are two divisions of the nervous system. There is the sensory division, also known as the afferent division. And afferent just means carrying something towards something else. So for instance, afferent bronchial arteries in a shark carry, carries deoxygenated blood towards the gills. So afferent means towards something. And so the afferent division relays messages towards the central nervous system from the peripheral nervous system. There are two subdivisions of the sensory or afferent division, first of which is the somatic subdivision, which involves nerves that carry signals towards the CNS from muscles, bones, joints, and the skin. There's also the visceral subdivision of the sensory division, and that is nerves that carry signals from organs to the central nervous system. Now, the efferent division is the motor division. Efferent just means carrying something away from something else. So efferent bronchial arteries, for instance, in a shark carry oxygenated blood away from the gills. So in the efferent division of the nervous system, messages are being carried away from the central nervous system and towards the peripheral nervous system. In essence, the uh, messages are being carried towards what are known as effectors, which are basically just muscles and the glands. The two subdivisions of the efferent division are the somatic division, which innervates skeletal muscles. So in this case, skeletal muscles are gonna be the effectors. And there's also the autonomic subdivision, which innervates smooth muscle and cardiac muscle and glands. So basically anything that is involuntary. Now the autonomic nervous system, once again, is an efferent division carrying a signal away from the CNS to the PNS. Once again, it innervates smooth and cardiac muscle as well as glands, so anything that is involuntary. And the autonomic nervous system has its own two subdivisions. It has the sympathetic branch or the E division, which is involved in, for instance, the fight or flight response or the emergency response. It's also involved in excitement and embarrassment and exercise. So if we look at the picture here, we can see um, certain things that occur in the sympathetic division. You have dilation of pupils, you have inhibition of the sal uh, salivary production, right, in the mouth. It also dilates the bronchi in the lungs, accelerates heart rate, stimulates the secretion of epinephrine and norepinephrine, which is basically adrenaline, right, involved in the fight or flight response. Also stimulates glucose release, and glucose is needed for energy. It also inhibits um, the stomach, the pancreas, and the intestine. It inhibits urination and it also promotes ejaculation and vaginal contractions. Now the parasympathetic um, branch is also called the D division because it is involved primarily in digestion, diuresis, and defecation. So if we look at the picture here, we see the parasympathetic division. This is our constriction of the pupil. It stimulates saliva production. It constricts the bronchi. It slows your heart rate. It stimulates the stomach, the pancreas, and the intestine. It stimulates urination and promotes the erection of genitals. So moving on from all the different subdivisions, let's look at a neural pathway. So it all begins with the transduction of a stimulus into an electrical impulse. That um, electrical impulse is transmitted to the thalamus and the thalamus acts as a relay center. And so from the thalamus, depending on the type of signal and the different area that it's associated with, from the thalamus that impulse is gonna be relayed 
to that specific area of the cerebral cortex. So if it's involved in auditory function, it's going to be relayed to the primary auditory cortex, for instance. And it is there that the interpretation of the impulse is going to take place. Um, here, this particular example is involved in um, the primary motor cortex, which is the precentral gyrus of the frontal lobe. So in this case, the, um, the impulse is being transmitted to the primary motor cortex. And then from there, you're going to get the transmission of the efferent message, which is going to, remember, relay the signal away from the central nervous system towards the peripheral nervous system, where you are then going to get a motor response. So I know in your pre-lab, this was one of the questions. And I guess I kind of I misunderstood exactly what they were looking for. So this would be the correct order of events that occur along the neural pathway. Um, so make sure that you change that in your pre-lab, for instance. All right, so the nervous system is primarily made of nervous tissue, which contains neurons or the impulse conducting cells. It also contains neuroglial cells, which are the supporting cells. And there are three types of connective tissues that surround a nerve. So a nerve is primarily made of both nervous tissue and connective tissue. The connective tissue is going to be the epineurium, the perineurium, and the endoneurium. So beginning with neurons, there are billions of neurons in your entire body. There are clusters of neurons in the central nervous system. These are called nuclei. Clusters of neurons in the peripheral nervous system are called ganglia. And these carry electrical signals. Now, there are different types of potentials that I'm actually going to go over, um, not in too much detail, but you might need to know it at some point, for instance. So I thought I'd go over um, graded potentials and action potentials um, just sort of briefly. Dendrites, for instance, transmit graded potentials. Axons transmit action potentials. So we will go over these quite briefly. Um, real quick, let's look at the anatomy of a neuron. So the plasma membrane surrounding an entire neuron is called the axolema. There's also the cell body or the soma of a neuron that holds the cell's metabolic machinery. This is the nucleus and the cytoplasm, the nissel bodies, the neurofibrils that make up the cytoskeleton, and the axon hillock. There are also dendrites, and dendrites are going to receive information from a presynaptic neuron. The axon is what transmits the electrical impulse. Parts of an axon include the telendria, which are towards the end of these little branches, right, that sort of morph into this little bulbous axon terminal at the synaptic cleft. And it is at these terminals that are going to be um, the location of these synaptic vesicles. And inside the vesicles are neurotransmitters. And it's those vesicles that are being released into the synaptic cleft and are being received by a postsynaptic cell. Also, on an axon, you might see what's called myelin sheath. Myelin sheath is very important because it can result in faster propagation of a signal via what are known as nodes of Ranvier. So at these nodes, the signal is going to jump from node to node rather than propagating along the entire length of the neuron. And so if the signal is jumping, you can imagine that it'll scale the length of the entire axon significantly faster. All right, let's go over some of the types of neurons. This is excluding the anexonic neuron on the left. We're only going to focus on the bipolar, the unipolar, and the multipolar. So the multipolar neuron is most commonly found in the central nervous system. It's multipolar because it has one axon but can have multiple dendrites. All motor neurons are, in essence, multipolar neurons. And then many of the sensory neurons in the central nervous system can also be multipolar neurons. Um, now, bipolar neurons are very specialized, and you find them in the retina, in the olfactory epithelium, and you can even find them in your inner ear. Bipolar neurons are characterized by 
two processes emerging from the cell body, one of which is the axon, the other is the dendrite. Okay. Now, unipolar neurons are found primarily in the peripheral nervous system. You only see one process emerging from the cell. It's these unipolar neurons are exclusively sensory neurons, and their cell bodies are actually found in the ganglia of the peripheral nervous system. Now, I just wanted to briefly discuss membrane potential. Now, I don't, you don't have to know this for lab, of course, but you may have to know this for lecture, and it's still important otherwise when it comes to learning um, the nervous system and the processes involved in transmitting an electrical signal. And so we're going to begin with resting potential. This is when there's no signal being propagated across the axon. The resting potential is maintained at about negative 60 millivolts, and we will get to why. Now, there are several processes that are maintaining the resting potential, one of which is an open potassium channel, where potassium is leaving the cell via passive diffusion. And diffusion, of course, is just when an ion moves from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. And there are a lot of potassium ions inside the cell. And so they are going to be passively diffusing out of the cell via open potassium channels. Now there are also leaky sodium channels, and Na plus is just referring to the sodium ion. And this is where sodium is leaking into the cell via a passive electrical force. So the inside of the cell is negatively charged. Those sodium ions are positively charged. So they are moving into the cell via that electrical force. Now both the potassium channels and the sodium channels are passive movement of the ions across the cellular membrane. But there's also an active pump called the sodium potassium pump that is active because it requires ATP. And of course, we all know that ATP is what provides the cellular processes with energy. And it is this sodium potassium pump that is actively restoring resting state of the neuron. So you'll see in this picture here that for every two potassium ions that enter the pump, there are three sodium ions that are entering the pump. The sodium ions get pumped out of the inside of the cell. The potassium ions get pumped in. And so what's happening is, is that because the potassium ions are found in higher concentrations on the inside of the cell, the resting potential is then the same as the equilibrium potential of a potassium ion, which is negative 60 millivolts. So therefore, the resting potential is maintained at about negative 60 millivolts. Now there are two terms that you need to be familiar with, and that is hyperpolarization and depolarization. Now hyperpolarization is when the membrane potential becomes more negative. Depolarization is when the membrane potential becomes less negative, and it is depolarization that results in the transmission of an electrical signal down the axon. Now there is also graded potentials that occur within the dendrites of the postsynaptic neuron. Now the graded potential is called graded because it arises from the summation of individual actions of ligand gated ion channel proteins. So you'll see here that there's spatial summation where a signal is basically received at different locations on a dendrite and those signals Right at this point, these signals are coming from the presynaptic neuron. The magnitude of these signals is going to be summed together. Okay, there's also temporal summation where you get several signals coming one after another. And basically, the summation of these signals has to reach a threshold in order for depolarization to occur. Now, in a graded potential, the signal spreads passively down the dendrite, and it also decreases over time and with distance. So in order for the um, signal to reach a threshold, 
that summation has to be fast, okay? Because if the temporal summation between each signal, for instance, is a large span of time, it might not reach that threshold. And of course, with regards to graded potential, the size of the response is equal to the size of the stimulus. So you want large signals. And it's that threshold that those signals have to sum up to that is necessary to propagate a signal down an axon. So the action potential is what actually carries the electrical message from the dendrite down the, ax the axon, right? And so the dendrite is receiving a graded potential from the presynaptic neuron. That graded potential travels um, down the dendrite. And if the sum of the signals reaches a threshold, then depolarization is going to occur. And it is when depolarization occurs at that threshold that you have um, started an action potential. The action potential is very rapid. It's an all or nothing response. If it, if it occurs, it occurs. Um, with a graded potential, right, if you don't reach threshold, then it's just going to degrade, right? With an action potential, it's all or nothing, and it's very unidirectional. So the threshold for depolarization at an axon hillock is about negative 40 millivolts. This figure says it's negative 55. You're obviously going to get different numbers with different manuals. Here in the axon, uh, unlike the graded potential, um, the firing frequency reflects the magnitude of the depolarization event. And down the axon, the propagation of the signal is um, maintained via voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels. So it's no longer a passive system. So we're just going to quickly look at this here for the action potential. You'll see that at resting state, which is number one, you have those passive sodium, um, sorry, those passive potassium channels where potassium is leaving the cell via diffusion. You have the leaky sodium channels where sodium ions are entering the cell via the electrical force. You also have the sodium potassium pumps at that point. Now let's say that a postsynaptic neuron has reached a threshold. This is when depolarization occurs, or number two. So at this point, when depolarization occurs, those potassium channels close and the sodium channels then open. And this depolarization causes the membrane potential to reach about plus 35 millivolts. That is the equilibrium potential for sodium ions, right? The resting potential is the equilibrium potential for the potassium ions. Now, depolarization is what causes the rising phase. This is when the sodium channels are open and the sodium ions are entering the cell. The falling phase um, occurs when the sodium channels are then deactivated and the potassium channels open, right? And then you're going to get what's called hyperpolarization of the membrane. And it's at this point in hyperpolarization where the membrane potential reaches about negative 80 millivolts. So kind of, it's like the undershoot, right? And then eventually it'll return to the resting state of negative 60 millivolts. Now, I want to just make it clear that this isn't, so your entire axon isn't made of just one potassium channel, two sodium channels, and a sodium potassium pump. These channels occur in groupings along the entire length of the axon that the signal is propagating down. So as one channel closes, the next one opens, and it just keeps propagating down the axon. And that is an action potential until it reaches the synaptic cleft where the signal turns into a chemical signal known as a neurotransmitter that gets packaged in these vesicles and released at the synaptic cleft. So that is enough of neurons and membrane potentials. Let's look at glial cells, right? Glial cells are the supporting cells that you can find in both the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Let's just quickly look at the glial cells of the central nervous system. You have the astrocytes. These anchor neurons to any capillary, and they also form the blood-brain barrier.
Um, so you guys are probably um, familiar with the brain eating amoeba that a lot of people get when they use neti pots but they don't heat up the water and so what's happening is that when you pour the liquid in the neti pot up your nose you're actually bypassing that blood-brain barrier and so if you don't heat up that water and that brain-eating amoeba is there it bypasses those astrocytes and of course that never ends up very good um, there's also the oligodendrocytes these produce myelin sheath to insulate the axons of the central nervous system you guys should know by now that the myelin sheath results in faster propagation of a signal there are also microglial cells these are basically phagocytic cells there's epidemal cells which produce cerebrospinal fluid they also line hollow cavities um, the glial cells of the peripheral nervous system are going to include the Schwann cells. These are sort of at the bottom of this picture here. These produce myelin sheath in the peripheral nervous system. And then there are also satellite cells that are functioning and maintaining your ionic balance in the extracellular membrane.